Hey class, welcome. Welcome to a new semester and welcome to History 17. Today we are going to cover Chapter 1 in this narrated PowerPoint video. So please make sure that you have next to you a notepad so that you are taking notes as I am talking. And if you have any questions, please let me know via email or office hours. Let's get started. So what you see here is a list of key terms. The key terms in my class are like a guidepost for you. I find that students often get overwhelmed when it comes to history because history has so much information. So these key terms are the things that you should focus on throughout the lecture. Two main questions you wanna ask yourself when you look at the key terms. The first is, do I know the definition of these key terms? Can I define what it is? Secondly, do I understand why this key term is important in the broader context of US history? And if you focus on those two things, and if you can answer those two questions, what is it? And secondly, uh, what is the importance of it? then you will have a very good uh, skill set and a very good understanding going into any quizzes or any exams that you will be taking on these key terms. All of the quizzes and all of the exams are based on the key terms from the lecture. There are also key terms in your textbook and oftentimes the two key terms will overlap. Sometimes I will add my own key terms. So it's always good to have a combination of both lecture material and text material. So we're going to begin by looking at a map of the world over time. And of course, this is outside of my expertise. I'm a historian. We typically are experts in things that are documented throughout time. And then we have our anthropologists and our archaeologist colleagues that help us understand ancient, the ancient time and the ancient world. But what we see here is a really interesting evolution of the map of the world. Beginning 2.4 million years ago, you will see here, let me bring up my little laser pointer here, you will see here on this map that the world was basically made up of one gigantic continent. And folks that study this type of thing call this giant continent Pangea. Pangea. And over time, because of tectonic activity and plate activity across the globe, these continents slowly start to drift apart. So you can see here one point, or, or excuse me, 135 million years ago, you've got this map, move along to 65 million years ago, you've got this map, and then move to the present day, and you now have a very familiar looking map of the world. Now, one of the interesting things about the history of humanity is that it was only about 200,000 years ago that our modern ancestors really took to this earth. So when we think about it in this geologic sense over a long period of time, we can see that really human activity and human um, uh, presence on the earth is relatively new in terms of geological terms, right? We're kind of babies when it comes to being on the planet and adapting to the planet. And so 200,000 years ago, you've got Homo sapiens, we're coming out of Africa, and so obviously the question then is, okay, well, if human beings are only 200,000 years ago, we know that human beings originated on the continent of Africa. How then did humans get from Africa all the way to North America? North America is an isolated continent at this time. Both North and South America are isolated from Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia. Um, and Antarctica. So, I mean, how the question is, how did humans get there? So, this question has been studied quite extensively. 
And the predominant theory is that there was a land bridge that developed as a result of the Ice Age. Beringia is the name of the land bridge named after the Bering Sea and the Bering Strait. And it connected Asia with North America up um, where there is now modern day Siberia and Alaska. So you can see here this ice bridge essentially during the ice age because you've got these massive glaciers and you've got the icing over of the oceans up here in the North Pacific, um, you're, you're going to have this bridge that opens up. People from Asia then followed migrations of large animals that they hunted across this land bridge, unknowingly really, onto a brand new continent, onto the North American continent. And from there, as the glaciers begin to recede about 13,000 years ago, people start to migrate down. And there's this ice-free um, corridor that opens up along the eastern Rockies, the Canadian Rockies. Um, and then you also have the possibility of people migrating down the coastal regions. And this is a very sort of intriguing possibility. It's called the Kelp Highway um, Theory. And that means that human beings were, were building boats and were essentially... Um, cruising down the coast, allowing them to get into far, farther down into Central America and then eventually into South America. Now, the seas themselves were about um, 400 uh, feet lower, shallower than they are today. So even if that was a, a true theory that the human beings that were coming down the Kelp Highway had habitations and areas of existence along the coast, we no longer would be able to see evidence of that um, because the seas have risen since the melting of the glaciers and since the last ice age. But it's very intriguing to think about that. Um, the temperatures along the coast would have been milder and certainly they would have had access to a lot of food, right? You have fish, of course, you can eat kelp, so they could have eaten the kelp. Um, so it's an intriguing theory, but one that we can't definitive, definitively um, prove. There's other theories that talk about people from the, this, um, from the South Pacific actually building boats, um, similar to the ancestors of the modern-day uh, Hawaiians, um, that sailed across the Pacific and landed into South America as well. Again, no evidence of that, but it's still a very intriguing theory. But the, the most common theory is the Beringia Ice Bridge. Um, and as the Ice Age came to an end, this area right here ended up turning back into the Bering Sea, connecting with the Arctic Ocean, creating the Bering Strait right here, um, and, and uh, creating a division between the two continents of Asia and North America once again. So here's, here's just another map that kind of gives you another perspective of the migration patterns of the people that came across to North America at the time. We think that they probably broke into three different groups. Um, one of the groups, again, going down this ice-free corridor of the Canadian Rockies and then dispersing out throughout the lands of North America and probably down into Central and South America as well. Then there is the Kelp Highway migration theory, again, not to be proven, but still an intriguing theory and probably quite probable. And then the third migration pattern going across um, and these are going to be the folks that will later on become the Inuit people. They never really leave this Arctic region up here. They settle in, they adapt to the environments, et cetera. So um, there was kind of this horizontal migration here, as well as a southward migration um, into North, uh, Central, and South America. So this is just a photograph of an example of the type of landscape that these early humans probably would have uh, come across as they were going on their migration across uh, the Bering, uh, the Beringia Bridge. 
Um, you can see here that it's kind of like an open sort of tundric plain. Um, you could imagine, you know, groups of primitive human beings traveling in, in bands of maybe 20, 25, um, mostly family um, groups or multiple family groups. And they're, they're following these herds of animals, right? So you have the giant woolly man mammoths, you have the saber-toothed tigers, you have these animals that if they would have been able to kill them, it would have sustained one group of say 25 human beings for up to a month. So it's pretty, it, so they were able to work together in these groups to kind of communicate with each other. And this is actually where language originates is through these hunting groups where you had to coordinate these attacks on these massive animals, right? Because obviously uh, one human being is nothing compared to a giant, giant woolly mammoth or a mastodon, right? So you cannot just one human being take down a creature like that. You have to work um, with your fellow hunters to make that happen. Similar to um, the uh, females in the in the in the groups, um, you would have you know to communicate in order to um, harvest certain plants. So they did gather plants, and also for taking care of children, right? Communicating information to children, communicating um, uh, ways of being and how to function within the society. So these are all the origins of early communication and early language. Okay, so you have these bands of humans, and archaeologists refer to these first people arriving in the Western Hemisphere as Paleo-Indians, Paleo-Indians. Sometimes you'll also hear them referred to as Amera indians but these Paleo-Indians are a very specific group of people. These are people who are migratory, they are also primarily meat eaters. So as I mentioned, um, the hunting bands were extremely important to these early people. These giant animals could have sustained one band for up to a month in some cases. Um, as I mentioned, these are small bands of people, so somewhere between 25 to 50 people. They're following this large, these large games. They're migrating with the seasons. Um, depending upon the weather, et cetera. These are the same people that are going to travel southward down the ice-free corridor, perhaps down the Kelp Highway. They're also doing that horizontal migration and, and settling into these Arctic areas. So Paleo-Indians are important because they are the earliest ancestors of the Native Americans. Um, and they also sort of establish these very um, kind of, uh, I would say, very cohesive uh, cultures based on hunting um, and based on coordination and cooperation when it comes to hunting. So we know that these Paleo Indians existed throughout the Americas. Um, especially in North America, and we know this because of the artifacts that were left behind. You're looking right now at the first Clovis point that was found. It was found in New Mexico in 1929. These Clovis points, and this particular one dates back to 1000 BCE, so that's before Common Era. So that is quite a long time ago. That is 13,000 years ago. And this, these Clovis points were obviously crafted. They were created as tools uh, for hunting. So they would have been uh, attached to a spear um, and they would have been used with an atelier, which is a special instrument that is used to um, uh, allow the hunter to throw at a longer distance. So some of you might be familiar with those um, special ball throwers that they, they make for dogs that like to fetch. Um, think of an Adelaide as kind of like a primitive one of those um, that you attach your spear to, um, and it helps thrust your spear forward and can be um, very deadly. And so these Clovis points are actually found uh, throughout North America. So we know that generally, 
when these first paleo Indians arrived, they're arriving, there are these small bands of people and they're essentially existing and living off of meat, um, thus the name paleo Indian, because of course, as we know, the paleo diet is primarily a meat diet. Okay, so this um, was the way in which these early primitive human beings uh, lived. They lived primarily in natural shelters as well. So they would live in caves and things like that. This is kind of what we think of when we think of the caveman, right? The paleo Indian is essentially the caveman. Um, but what ends up happening is again, sort of this interesting and also a little bit of a mysterious phenomenon around sometimes around 11,000 years ago, these large game um, that these paleo Indians were hunting uh, begin to disappear. And there are lots of different theories as to why this happens. Uh, of course, a very predominant theory is environmental change. Um, you have the end of the ice age at this particular time. So there is a lot of environmental change happening. Um, there's also a theory of disease. Um, there's also been the theory of overhunting um, by these paleo Indians. Um, I think it was probably most likely a combination of all of those things combined. Um, it would be very unlikely that a mass extinction, extinction uh, would be caused um, by just one of those things. Um, typically mass extinctions are a combination of factors, um, unless, you know, with the exception being some sort of catastrophic event, you know, like a meteor hitting the earth or a, uh, Balkan, uh, you know, a volcano erupting or something like that, that would cause sort of some cataclysmic event. Um, but that was not the case, um, at this particular time. It's just that slowly over time, uh, these large animals begin to disappear. So you've got the disappearance of the mastodons, the saber-toothed tigers, uh, the large uh, North American sloth, uh, the dire wolves, um, these massive animals, um, which by the way, if you've never been to the La Brea Tar Pits, which is in uh, Los Angeles, you can actually see they have a museum there once museums open up. If they, I'm not sure if they're open, but um, it, they have these museums, uh, this museum there and, uh, on display are all of these different bones that they've found in these tar pits from this particular ice age um, time period. Um, and it's really quite remarkable. It really um, strikes you when you see the actual structures of the animals and the size of the animals, um, you know, in person. So what happens is when this environmental change happens, when this extinction happens slowly over the course of a couple thousand years, um, the paleo Indians are forced to adapt. They're forced to um, take whatever resources they have available to in their region and adapt and essentially work um, off and live off of their environment. Um, and this is where uh, um, anthropologists think that we get all of the different cultural diversities that exist amongst Native people. Um, Native Americans are a very diverse group of people. Um, Native American tribes have very sort of different traditions, um, different diets, um, different ways of hunting, different ways of living, different ways of habitating in their um you know, their houses, um, all of that, of course, has to do with adaptation to the environment. So this cultural diversity, the diversification of Native American cultures is the result of this environmental change that takes place and this extinction um, that takes place beginning about 11,000 years ago. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a map of Native American tribes throughout North America at about 1500. So this is right after contact. Um, uh, Columbus landed in 1492. Many of these tribes probably would have had no idea that Europeans were on the, the shorelines and cruising around, although they did have very extensive trading networks. So, you know, I'm sure that the word spread rather rapidly. 
But this is about 1500. You can see the map and the various tribal groups spread throughout North America. This is not a comprehensive map, so this isn't going to show you all of the tribal groups. So, for example, you have over here in California, you have the Pomo, the Chumash, and the Luceno. None of the, these are all important tribes in California, but there are over 100 tribes throughout California. So you can really see the limitations of this map. But the important thing here is that I wanted to emphasize that all of these regions are very different, right, in terms of their environment. Even in California alone, you have all of these different micro environments. So these tribes are all different. Um, based on their environment and the adaptation to their environment. So you have different ways of having shelter, you have different hunting methods, you have different diets, um, you have different um, confederations. So one of the really important confederations amongst uh, Native American tribes was the Iroquois Confederation, which you can see here. Um, and this uh, confederation was one of the things that really struck some of the early founders of our nation because the Iroquois had created this tribal group of five different tribes that worked together, but they maintained their autonomy. So it's very much based on this idea of federalism where you have these different autonomous nations and so for the United States, the analogy would be the states, right? So you have each of these autonomous states, but they unite over one umbrella, right? And in this case, it's the Iroquois Confederacy. So this was a big inspiration for a lot of the early founders and the people that observed the Iroquois and their political system. Um, so they're, they're very influential. Another group that we're gonna be talking about in this class is the Alagwanquin, um, who you see pictured here. This is the Chesapeake region. This is the area where the first English, a successful English settlement uh, was located in Virginia at Jamestown. Um, and then also up here, the Wampanoag, the Pequot, the Mohican. These are all the tribes that had initial contact with the Pilgrims and the Puritans. Um, so all of these tribes are going to be very influential in early U.S. history. Ultimately, all of these tribes are very influential. Keep in mind that these are the descendants of the original Paleo-Indians that existed, that came across the Beringia land bridge, and they have adapted to the environment of North America successfully. Um, and really the, the early Europeans, um, if they were smart, they'd listen to them and they uh, learned from them. Um, unfortunately, because of the cultural differences that existed between those two groups, um, that often didn't happen. And we're going to talk more about that later on in this lecture. But I wanted to give you a sense of just an overview of the uh, North America right after contact and the various different tribal groups that existed here. Some of them were sedentary, meaning they had um, villages that they set up and they lived in generation after generation. Some of them were semi-nomadic, where they would uh, move seasonally from one place to another. Some of them had agriculture um, and irrigation systems. Some of them uh, didn't and didn't have a need for it because they had such abundant resources. So a perfect example is, again, the California tribes, where you had so much of an abundance of resources that there really wasn't a need to have agriculture. They, they could gather and hunt every, everything that they needed. So um, those are. I just wanted to give an overview before we begin to talk about first contact, which is next. All right, so in steps the famous Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus is credited as being the first uh, European expedition, the Columbus expedition, um, to reach the Americas. This, in fact, is not true. There were European expeditions prior to Columbus, the Vikings, and probably the Portuguese and others who fished off of the coast of Newfoundland. However, Christopher Columbus did do something that had never been done prior, which is that uh, he and his Spanish crew established 
permanent European colonies in the Americas. Christopher Columbus, who was span uh, sailing for the Spanish crown, was in fact Italian, born in Genoa, Italy in 1476. He was the son of a weaver, but uh, had higher aspirations, and so he apprenticed on ships, so soon learned how not just to sail, but also how to navigate. Uh, he went on multiple expeditions along the African coast, which was very much dominated by the Muslim trade at this point, and also the Portuguese trade. The Portuguese and the Spanish at this point were competing with each other for um, trade, trade and influence um, in Africa. So he's going on these uh, sailing expeditions, um, and it just so happened that one day he was off of the coast of France, um, and his ship was att attacked by French privateers, and uh, it was sunk, and he ended up having to swim to shore. Well, this actually turned out to be a very positive thing for Christopher Columbus, because he ended up landing on the shores of Portugal, which through his, um, the people that he knew and sort of his influence, he was able to name drop enough of people that he will eventually end up marrying a noblewoman, uh, a Portuguese noblewoman by the name of Felipe Perestrello. And it's through this noble connection that Christopher Columbus is able to sort of weasel his way into the Spanish court. And, you know, the Portuguese and the Spanish, a lot of them were related. Um, and so he was able then to petition Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, who were the monarchs of Spain at the time, um, to try to get them to fund this expedition. He had a theory that you could sail from the Canary Islands, which is a set of islands off of the coast of Africa, to Japan in just 2,300 miles. And he, he thought that by sailing west that you could go across the Atlantic and reach Asia. He was estimating the size of the earth then to be somewhere around the circumference of the earth to be somewhere around 12,200 miles. Um, in fact, we know today that the circumference of the earth is about twice that at 25,000 miles. But at the time, of course, nobody understood or knew that there was this gigantic continent um, in between uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia. And of course, that is the Americas. So eventually in 1492, because the king and queen of Spain had successfully carried out their reconquista, which was essentially um, taking back the Iberian Peninsula from both the Muslim Moors of Spain and the Jewish population that lived there. They figured that because they were celebrating from this victory, that they really had nothing to lose. So they agreed to Columbus's proposition. They gave him three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. The Santa Maria was the flagship, and that was the one that Columbus sailed on. They left uh, the coast of Spain um, and they sailed to the Canary Islands, where from there they launched out into the unknown. So you can see here, let's put on the laser pointer. So you can see here it departs on August 3rd, 1492 from Palos, Spain, down to the Canary Islands, September 3rd. Of 1492 and from there they take off into the unknown. They're sailing across the Atlantic Ocean and they are expecting to hit Japan. Instead what they hit is a small island um, and it's still kind of disputed as to where exactly um, they landed. Um, some say that they landed on San Salvador, some say they landed on Samana Key, um, and you can see right here the little insert map right here that kind of gives a little blow up of this region. So there are lots of little islands in this area. So there was lots of possibilities. Um, they reach their destination on October 12th. So they are at sea for a little over a month, about six weeks, um, before they spot land and they are able to make anchor. 
Altogether, Columbus will sail four voyages to the Americas. His first voyage, um, they established a, a town on the island of Hispaniola. This actually happened um, after the Santa Maria was wrecked. Um, so the Santa Maria was wrecked. They were only down to two ships. They were forced to build a makeshift city that they called Via de la Navidad. Um, it was right around Christmas town uh, time, and so they named it Christmas Town. And he left behind 39 of his crew um, to return back to Spain. Um, and on his return voyage with the two remaining ships, he brought with him th uh, five Native Americans, which he then presented to the king and queen of Spain. More on that later. Um, he then set off on a second voyage, which then went throughout, again, the Caribbean, um, discovered Cuba. So Hispaniola, which was the original settlement, is now Haiti in the Dominican Republic, modern-day Haiti in the Dominican Republic. Um, and then Cuba, of course. And Cuba is going to become the headquarters of the Spanish Empire, at least early on um, in the Americas. Um, his third voyage then reaches uh, the mainland of uh, South America. You can see here the green line. So he's exploring the coastline here. Obviously must have realized that this was a very large landmass. Um, and again, the fourth voyage will um, ha uh, explore this Central American region here in the Panamanian Isthmus. Um, and so... Columbus, to his dying day, um, insisted that he had found the Indies, that he had found, um, that's the reason why this entire region, before it was called the Caribbean and the Bahamas, was actually called the West Indies. Um, and so in a lot of those old documents that you see, it's referred to as the West Indies because Columbus insisted that he had reached um, areas off the coast of India and thus, of course, gave the names of the inhabitants of this area, Indians, um, which was incorrect, but a name that stuck. The first native people that Columbus will come in contact with is the Tayanos people. They were a very peaceful, um, small tribal population, agriculture, they cultivated plants, and it was very clear to Columbus early on that they were extremely unfamiliar with uh, Europeans. Um, first and foremost, they were frightened. Um, they saw the large ships. Uh, they saw the uh, the horses um, that were brought on the ships. They saw the Spanish weapons, the swords, and they grabbed them by the blades. They were obviously completely ignorant of uh, the tools at the time, the European tools and also the technology, the European technology at the time. As I said, Columbus insisted that he was off the coast of India um, and maybe just south of Japan, and so he insisted on calling the indigenous people Indians. Um, it was very qu quick that the cultural misunderstandings began between these two populations. Um, the Spanish had a, a particular ritual that they did every time they landed on new land. It was called the requirmiento. It was a basically a proclamation that claimed that particular piece of land for the king and queen of Spain. And so this ritual was performed. Um, it was performed in front, of, in front of the native people. A cross was erected. This um, pronunciation was said. Um, and, and it is likely that the indigenous population had very little understanding of what was happening. But the one thing that the Spanish did do is they brought gifts and they brought things to exchange with the indigenous people. So they brought with them things like beer, beads. They brought with them cotton. Um, they, of course, had uh, European tools um, and metals that they could exchange with the indigenous people. And the indigenous people understood that. They understood the rituals of gift giving. Um, and so there was a little bit of kind of peace, I guess, but it was very tenuous. Um, but primarily, the, the Spanish wanted to um, claim the land for Spain. Um, they wanted to ensure that the indigenous population would eventually convert to Catholicism. Um, 
And they wanted to find some riches. They wanted to find some gold. And one of the things that they did is they looked to the uh, indigenous population to see if they could find any kind of evidence of precious metals. And indeed, they did um, see evidence of precious metals in these early encounters. Um, the indigenous people were wearing, you know, earrings in their uh, noses and in their ears, um, bracelets, um, necklaces um, that were made from gold. And of course, um, Columbus notes this extensively in his journals. Um, he also noted in his journals that he thought that the indigenous population would make very good servants. Um, and so he really saw them as being kind of docile, um, a little bit dumb. Um, and he certainly saw the Spanish, and you really see this in his writings, as certainly being superior to them. Okay, so here you see an image of an artist rendering of this first contact. Um, you can see the Spanish ships in the background. Uh, you can see the soldiers here uh, erecting the cross, um, and they are, um, you know, declaring this land for the king and queen of Spain. Um, you can see here, initially, you can see native people running. Um, but then in this, uh, here you see this, the, the native people coming, approaching the Spanish, um, exchanging gifts. So the initial reaction of the native people was one of fear, um, but, uh, they slowly sort of had this gift exchange, um, ritual that they did between the Spanish and the native people. And eventually they, there was a certain level of, let's say tenuous trust. It definitely was not a uh, full trust. Um, and the, the native people, I think, were inclined um, to trust the Spanish. They certainly were fascinated by the Spanish and their various um, technology and tools and things like that. The Spanish, on the other hand, really had no intention of, you know, um, seeing the native population as being any kind of equal to them. Um, they looked down upon them, as I mentioned in the previous slide. One of the most important consequences of these early contact between the Spanish and the native people is something called the Columbian Exchange. Obviously, you can see Columbian, it's named after Christopher Columbus, because this exchange began after this first contact. So what is the Columbian Exchange? The Columbian Exchange is the transfer of previously unknown plants, animals, people, and products between the old and the old world. Here we're talking about Afro-Eurasia, so we're talking about Europe, Africa, and Asia, and the new world, which is, of course, the Americas. This is called the Columbian Exchange because there were previously unknown species of plants, animals, that were now being exchanged between these two regions. The Columbian Exchange is important because it transforms environments, it transforms economies, um, it transforms diets, and most importantly, it will transform for the native people, it will be devastating this transformation with the introduction of European diseases. So European diseases like smallpox, like the influenza, like measles, uh, like the uh, pneumonic plague, all of these things were uh, diseases that Amerindians Indians didn't have any kind of antibodies for. And so these invisible pathogens are now being transferred by Europeans, um, in many cases unknowingly, um, to these indigenous populations. And so this will have a devastating impact. Um, we know that in some cases, particularly in these island um, areas, these tribal groups in these island areas in the Caribbean, up to 90% of the population will die as a result of contact with these diseases. This is certainly also true with the Aztec population, the Mexica Empire um, that Cortez will encounter later on. So the environmental impact is also very great. Um, we're talking about the introduction of 
uh, you know, non-indigenous mammals and birds. Um, there was lots of chopping down of forests for settlement all across the Americas and also for plantations, particularly in the Caribbean where giant sugar plantations uh, will be established uh, by the Spanish. There's also massive mining operations that will eventually um, happen in South America and also in Mexico. Um, the European plants and animals that will be introduced uh, will, in many cases, overtake the uh, native, you know, plants and, um, in some cases, the animals as well. So this is going to lead to the extinction of certain species. So this is just a list that shows us the different things that were being exchanged between these two regions of the world. So in the Americas, um, all of these products that you see listed here in the Americas, these are all endemic to America, meaning that they were only found in the Americas prior to contact. So you have chili peppers, bell peppers, tomatoes. Uh, coca or the cocao uh, plant, uh, corn, uh, tobacco, potatoes, and cochineal. And cochineal is a type of insect that is found on the prickly pear cactus. And when you dry that insect um, and crush it up, it makes a really, really bright red dye. And natural dyes and plants for natural dyes were highly desired by Europeans who like to wear lots of different colorful types of clothing. If we look over to Afro-Eurasia, um, we can see that lots of different products are going to be coming from uh, those regions. Wheat, rice, coffee, apples, oranges, horses, um, cows, sheep, pigs, um, guns and gunpowder. Um, the modern wheel um, was introduced by Europeans to the Americas. Um, of course, large ships, and most importantly, as I mentioned in the last slide, disease. So the Caribbean becomes known relatively quickly as the Spanish Lake, because as the Spanish established colonies in Hispaniola and also in Cuba, more and more people are coming to the Americas for opportunities. These people were generally referred to as conquistadors. These were typically young men coming from Spain that had little opportunity in Spain. So they might have been the sons of, you know, noblemen, but they were not the eldest son, so they weren't they didn't have a chance to get the inheritance, so they wanted an opportunity. Uh, they might have been people who uh, just simply were looking for adventure. Um, so this these are all, um, the types of the prototypes of the type of personality that would have come to the Americas. Interestingly, with the Spanish, the majority of the people that come are young men. Um, and so these young men are coming over to the Americas and they are establishing um, their homes here in the Americas, but they are also establishing families with indigenous women. Um, and this is going to be something that's a very different type of pattern than what we're going to see with the English later on when we talk about Jamestown, when we talk about the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the Plymouth Colony. Those are all going to be colonies that are, at least for the most part, are going to have women that are going to be coming over from Europe with those colonists. Um, that's different than what was happening here. Um, it is true, of course, that later on, as the colonies become more established, <coughs> excuse me, there will be European women that will come over to these Spanish colonies, but particularly early on, these are primarily male dominated um, colonies. And again, these men are often intermarrying and having children with indigenous women. These conquistadors um, are, there are many of them, um, but two of the most famous of these conquistadors is Francisco Pizarro, who goes down into South America and eventually conquers the Incan Empire. And then Hernan Cortes, who uh, famously goes to 
um, into the Aztec Empire and conquers the Aztec or the Mexica Empire in central Mexico. So here you see an image of Hernan Cortez. Uh, he was born in Medellin, Spain. He was the son of a minor noble family. And so he really sort of fits this uh, characteristic of the type of uh, young man that would come to the Americas. He was just 19 when he came to the Americas. He settled in Cuba. He very sort of quickly, you know, rose up through the Cuban political ranks and eventually will become the mayor of Santiago, Cuba. He was very fascinated by this idea of conquest and expansion of the Spanish Empire. And he had heard stories about this uh, empire that was located somewhere in central Mexico that was filled with riches and wealth, kind of like an El Dorado myth, if you will. And he was extremely ambitious. And so he actually gets permission um, to go on this expedition where he's going to take you know, 550 men, he's going to take a whole herd of horses, of course, lots of weapons, and land on the shore of mainland Mexico, um, searching for, seeking to go to this, uh, this kingdom, this empire, and establish it for the Spanish. So he does set sail for this, on this expedition in 1519. He lands on the shores of what is now modern-day Veracruz, um, and he sets up kind of a preliminary camp there on the shores of uh, the Caribbean Sea. And he is reaching out to the local population around where he's landing, and he eventually learns from these local populations that there is indeed this, you know, a, you know empire, this king, King Montezuma, um, that lives inland, and technically that they were part of that empire, but they were unhappy with his rulership. Um, they were scared of uh, the Aztecs of the Mexica. They would come around sometimes and ask for tribute for taxes from them, and sometimes that tribute would include human beings. Um, and so generally, Cortez starts to pick up on this idea that the 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 tribes that are surrounding this empire are actually unhappy with this uh, rulership of the Mexica, the Aztec Empire. And so he, he uses that as a way, he thinks of that as a way to eventually have um, some allies if he needs to call on these uh, native tribal allies in conquering um, the Aztecs. So he sets off on this expedition He's marching inland with his men, with his soldiers on their horses, right? And he's going to places where Europeans had never gone before. And as he's marching along this pathway to Tonichtitlan, um, he is event he will eventually, um, you know, again, he's going to make enemies in some cases, but he's also going to create allies. And this will become very important uh, moving forward for him. Okay, so you can see here the path of um, Hernan Cortez's expedition. Um, they are going along the Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula. Um, they eventually come up here to, again, what is now modern-day Veracruz. Um, and they're exploring these coasts. They're seeing that there are a lot of native people in this region. Um, it's relatively densely populated. Um, but they are completely unprepared for what they will find when they get to Tenochtitlan, um, which is now, of course, modern-day uh, Mexico City. So his expedition sets off, and they eventually reach Tenochtitlan um, in 1919. And this is what they see when they reach the Mexica capital this magnificent city that is estimated to have a population of around 200,000 people at its height. It was absolutely stunning to the Spanish that, um, that these people who they considered very primitive could have such remarkable built environments. 
They've got these magnificent causeways that go across these this lake. Um, they've got these gardens and these residences that appear to uh, float on top of the water. They've got this magnificent pyramid um, temple in the center of the city um, and some smaller temples around. Um, they, the, they are just completely blown away um, by this city. But that does not stop them from thinking that the people that live in this city are still uh, primitive, that they're below the Spanish. They are completely shocked um, by their religion. Um, they, uh, they're shocked by uh, the fact that it's clear that there are human sacrifices um, as part of their religion. Um, and so they kind of use that as an excuse to essentially take Montezuma, who is their king, and place him under house arrest. So when the Spanish get to Tenochtitlan, even though there is this, you know, sort of friendly reception by uh, King Montezuma and the Spanish, um, eventually the Spanish kind of take control. And like I said, they put um, King Montezuma under house arrest and they essentially occupy the city. They begin to slowly go into the Aztec temples and they replace the Aztec gods and um, goddesses, their, their statues uh, with crosses, um, with crucifixes. And again, of course, they, they said the requirimiento, they basically claimed the land uh, for the king and queen of Spain. Okay, so here you see an artist's rendering of the first meeting between Cortez and Montezuma. And you can see there's this elaborate ritual. We do know about uh, some things, about some details about what happened um, on this expedition by a man by the name of Bernal Diaz, um, who wrote um, actually later on in his life. So who knows if his recollections were completely correct, but he wrote a history of this called The Conquest of New Spain. And he was actually on the expedition. So you can actually look, if you're interested in reading some of these accounts and descriptions of the Aztec Mexica Empire, um, I would recommend checking that book out. It's a classic and it's easy to find. Again, the author is Bernal Diaz and uh, the name of the title of the book is The Conquest of New Spain. One of the things that Diaz does mention um, in his uh, book is a woman who traveled with Cortez. Uh, her native name is Malenche, but she converted to Christianity and changed her name to Doña Marina. And she becomes Cortez's wife or girlfriend, really. I mean, Cortez had a wife, so she was more like a girlfriend, I guess, but she does bear him a son. Um, this is sometimes considered the first mestizo, um, which means a somebody who is the child of a Spanish, um, Spanish, usually male, but it could be female, and uh, indigenous person. And so the mestizo population is born from uh, Doña Marina, right, in Mexico. And, and so she's looked at differently depending upon um, the story and the culture, but basically some people consider her like the mother of the Mexican people. Others consider her more like a traitor because she did help Cortez. Um, she did uh, serve as his interpreter and she actually saved his life on a couple of occasions when there were plots against his life. So here comes Cortez. He's coming into Tenochtitlan. Um, and as I mentioned, they put Montezuma under house arrest. They begin an occupation of the city. Um, eventually, uh, there will be some civil unrest uh, because Montezuma is not able to really effectively rule because he's under house arrest. Uh, Cortez actually leaves um, at one point, leaves to know Shilon, uh, leaves another person in charge. And when he does, there's some killing of some priests that take place. And so the, the people are angry, and um, what ends up happening is the people actually revolt against uh, Montezuma, 
and there's a riot in which uh, Rock hits his head and he eventually dies from his injury. And it's at that point that the Spanish really will have an advantage. Um, Cortez returns to Tenochtitlan with uh, some soldiers and also with some of his native allies. And this all happens in 1521. And eventually the city will be completely overtaken by the Spanish. Um, it will be become the capital of New Spain and Cortez will be declared the governor of the capital of New Spain. So as I mentioned before, right, um, the, the Europeans are bringing diseases and we know this to be true. Um, this is an uh, Aztec codex, which clearly shows this devastation from what is probably smallpox, as you can see from the um, rash that appears to be on the uh, bodies of these people. So uh, we know that uh, disease really devastated the population. So really, when we think about Cortez and his so-called conquest of the Aztecs, you have to think that he really had um, a lot of help, right? It wasn't that the Spanish just went in 1519 and they just quickly took down the Aztec Empire and they, you know, created the capital of New Spain. In fact, the entire process took two years. Um, so it wasn't until 1521 that um, Cortes will return with a large group of soldiers and some of his native allies. So there are three main reasons why Cortes was able to successfully eventually conquer the Aztecs. Number one, he had disease. He brought with him these invisible pathogens that were weakening the population. So that over the two years that the Spanish occupied Tenochtitlan, they were slowly spreading this disease throughout the population. Number two, Cortes had the native allies. He had um, the allies of the enemies of the Aztecs. And so he used that to his advantage. Um, and then finally, number three, yes, the Spanish did have weapons, right? These uh, weapons that in many ways were superior to what the Aztecs had. They also had horses. Um, so they were able to quickly get from one place to another. So they had some technological advantages as well. So for all three of those reasons, um, the Spanish were eventually able to topple this magnificent and very impressive empire of the Aztec or Mexica empire. Um, and that happens over the course of two years. By 1521, the Spanish have established the capital of Mexico City on the former city of Tenochtitlan. They have essentially destroyed, in many cases, all remnants of Aztec uh, culture and religion, and they have replaced it with uh, Christianity. So here is just an overview of Spanish expeditions throughout North America. Um, a few things I'll point out here. Um, so here we have Cuba, right? Here we have uh, Veracruz, which is where um, the Cortez expedition took off from Mexico City, formerly known as Tenochtitlan. Uh, Zacatecas, which is where a gigantic silver mine was discovered, so that becomes really important for the Spanish Empire. Um, you have these various expeditions also up the west coast, uh, the earliest of which was 1542 with the Cabrillo expedition. Uh, you also have the establishment of other Spanish outposts in North America, St. Augustine over here, and then Santa Fe up here in what is now New Mexico. These were two of the um, earliest um, established uh, cities uh, for the Spanish um, in North America. So you've got uh, Santa Fe, I mean, besides Mexico City, of course, but you've got Santa Fe, you've got St. Augustine. 
Now, I want to just point out that these particular colonial outposts of the Spanish were very sparsely populated. They, ne they always had a difficult time um, getting people to move into these upper regions. So the majority of the Spanish who were coming over to the Americas, they were establishing themselves in the Caribbean, in Cuba, um, or they were coming over to uh, what was renamed New Spain, what we now call Mexico. And this was certainly the most densely populated area of Spanish colonial America. You also, of course, have in South America the various outposts like Lima, Peru, which also become pretty populated. The Spanish are really going to be the first to establish themselves colonial presence in North America. And as I said, they are able to get rich pretty quickly from the various precious metals that they are able to find both in Mexico and in South America. And they quickly become um, very, very influential. Um, and they are catching the attention of other European nations. Um, you'll notice up here that um, there was a Spanish settlement that was attempted up here in the Chesapeake region. We are going to be talking a lot about the Chesapeake region in our next lecture. Um, but up here in Virginia, this was from 1570 to 1571. Um, that particular um, expedition and colony was completely wiped out um, by the native population. They were all killed. Um, so the Spanish, even though they tried to establish these northern colonies, um, it was unsuccessful. So we'll talk more about that later. But the Spanish, the first Europeans to really establish these colonies um, in the Americas. Okay, so before we move out of talking about um, this early period of American history, I want to just talk a lot about Native American culture. I know that this slide is very boring, um, but it is a very important slide because I want to establish really what, why was Native American culture looked at, viewed at as so much different than European culture, um, and why were there so many cultural misunderstandings? Early American history is marked with, and we will talk about it as we move through this course, multiple, multiple violent, um, very sad interactions between uh, Europeans and Native people. So Native American culture is very diverse across uh, North America, but there were certain things that were commonalities between all of the various tribal communities. So I'm going to talk about these right here, and I'm going to try to get us to understand why the Europeans saw this as so unusual, so strange. So the first is this belief in animism, right? So Native American people had this very strong belief, have a very strong belief, that spirits could be found in all things, right? All living things, they have a spirit. It has its own spirit to it. And we're talking animals, plants, trees, the water, the wind, right? Everything that is around us that is part of the earth. And these spirits are no, there is no hierarchy necessarily to these spirits. In other words, it is a recognition that we are all part of this sort of larger um, life system, right? And so this is a very, very different way of understanding the world than what the Europeans were coming in with. The Europeans were coming in with a very Christian-oriented idea of the way in which the world works, in which, of course, you have one God that is sort of the ultimate being, the ultimate spirit, um, and then you have human beings that are created in God's image, but could never really be as good as God. Um, and then you've got all the other living things underneath human beings. Um, and that's really sort of this hierarchy, this Christian hierarchy that, um, that the Europeans are coming into the Americas with. That is their way of understanding the world. And so they... They couldn't understand, they, they wouldn't have really been able to understand the fact that Native people really didn't see the world on that hierarchical plane. 
Instead, they saw themselves as uh, human beings, but as being very much a part of that natural world around them. Um, instead of the Christian view, which is that humans dominate the natural world around them. Okay, so that's number one, this belief in animism. Number two is this idea that land is seen as a common resource, not as an economic commodity. So what does that mean? What that means is that Native people understood that there were territories okay so it's not like they didn't have territorial boundaries they did different tribes had different uh, territories they had different hunting territories etc and people were expected to respect those boundaries however native people never saw the land the actual land underneath where they were living existing hunting etc as theirs as something that they could own and then exchange for personal gain. Um, that idea was very uh, unusual to them. Um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have occurred to them. And this is gonna cause a lot of problems because when Europeans come, right, they think, oh, we'll just buy this land from the native people, right? This is how they understand land exchange. Um, and so they come in and they bring, you know, some beads and some cloth, like let's use the example is uh, from the Manhattan example, the Isle of Manhattan, right? You've got, you know, a, a bolt of red cloth and a few beads and all of a sudden the Europeans come in and they, they give this to the local native tribe and all of a sudden the Europeans think, okay, now we own this land. Well, it's not very clear that the native people would have understand understood that exchange as meaning, oh, you're giving me this bolt of red cloth and now you think you own this land. Um, because again, the land was seen as a common resource. Um, there were no individual land owners um, in native society. Okay, and number three, actually number, yeah, number three, we've got um, generosity and gift exchange that was highly valued. So this is the other thing. Um, when Europeans came and uh, approached Native cultures and interacted with Native cultures, um, some of them would bring gifts, um, some of them didn't. Those that did bring gifts and um, engaged in this ritual of gift exchange, they would have had a better time um, at relating with the native culture because native people really saw gift exchange as being a sign of friendship and a sign of peace. It turns out that the Spanish um, and later on the French were much better at understanding this when it came to their interactions with native cultures. And so they tended to have uh, better um, relationships. That's not to say that they didn't um, engage in violent acts against Native people and that they didn't engage in sort of systematic genocide against Native people. That's certainly not what I'm suggesting. But what I'm suggesting is that the French and the Spanish had a much better understanding of this, this gift exchange kind of protocol. Um, the English, on the other hand, Right. The English come, they're establishing colonies at Jamestown, they're establishing colonies up in Plymouth and Massachusetts, and they don't understand this as well. And so right off the bat, there is some some tension there. Um, and so uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind when we're talking about specifically like first interactions, first contacts between native people and Europeans. Um, and then finally, number four, um, matrilineal societies. So in some Native American cultures, not all, uh, women were seen as the uh, ancestral lineage, the predominant ancestral lineage. So that is what a matrilineal society is. Um, this uh, happens when, so for example, I'm gonna give just a comparison, right? In the United States, um, it is very common for the children to get the man's last name. Um, in a matrilineal society, that would not happen. All of the woman's children would be given their surname, 
um, and the children would be seen as uh, going right through the women. So the women's line is the most important line, and the ma male line is kind of on the periphery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they father the children, but they don't have as much influence. Um, this is also true with property or like um, any kind of like, I'll give an example from the Navajo culture, which is a native, is a matrilineal society. So the Navajo, in the Navajo culture, right, land is um, passed down through the, the woman, um, but more importantly, the herds of sheep, which um, traditionally were just kind of a signs of wealth in the Navajo culture. This is all post, of course, contact with Europeans. Um, that that those sheep, those herds of sheep would be passed down through the woman. Um, this also includes female chiefs, female leaders. Um, women were seen, um, I think in all native societies, women were not seen as um, less than males, um, but um, in some native societies, women had um, really predominant roles. And this was very strange to the Europeans. The Europeans come along and, you know, they're told, okay, well, you have to go and negotiate with our chief, and the chief happens to be a woman. A European male at this particular time, you know, 16th, uh, 17th century, is going to feel very uncomfortable having those types of political um, economic conversations uh, with a female leader. So again, this is gonna cause a lot of cultural uh, misunderstandings right off the bat. Okay, so conversely, and I won't spend as much time on this because I think we kind of have a good understanding now, a base understanding of uh, Native American culture and why there would be a lot of misunderstandings, but the Europeans had very specific uh, views of Native people. Um, there was a very few Europeans that did have a certain level of respect for Native culture. They were certainly in the minority, and um, by minority I mean maybe one percent of Europeans might uh, come across Native culture and see some value in it. The majority of Europeans viewed Native Americans as uncivilized as barbaric. And I'm just going to go through the various sort of views. The first is, of course, religion. This was very predominant. You know, religion played a huge part in people's lives uh, back in the 15th, uh, 16th, 17th, even 18th century. I mean, this is all um, even 19th century. But, you know, I mean, uh, for the Europeans, uh, religion was really, in some cases, even the whole reason why they were coming to the Americas. And they saw the Native people as having no religion or essentially being devil worshipers. So, and we know this from the documents, right? This is where we get all of this information. I'm not making it up. Um, we know from the documents because the Europeans would write about the Native people and they would say, it appears that they have no religion or it appears that they... Uh, worship some false gods, you know. Um, so we know this, we know that this is the way that they viewed them. Secondly, this issue with land. So I talked about in the last slide how uh, Native people are basically seeing land as a common resource. Well, when Europeans come across the uh, Native people, what they say is, well, these people aren't using this land. Look at all of this land and all of these resources. Uh, we could build, you know, a mill or we could chop down these trees and build, you know, a town. And they're not doing any of that. You know, they are not cultivating the land. They are not building, you know, roads and they're not, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So when Europeans saw the Native people and saw the abundance of resources, they, they looked down upon them because they thought, wow, they're really not utilizing the resources that are surrounding them. And then finally, this last issue with gender. Um, and this is kind of related to this idea of matrilineal societies, but it's, it's a little bit different. Um, Europeans over and over again in their documents, in their writings about native people, um, would, they would do, they would, they would have two different views of gender relationships um, in native societies. 
In some cases, um, there was writings that indicated that European males saw Indian men as basically being weak, um, as, as being lazy, um, and that they treated their women unkindly because the women, Native women, worked. They worked hard and they did a lot of the work, particularly amongst tribes that had um, cultivated land. Women tech, uh, traditionally were in charge of a lot of the farm work and the cultivation of crops. Um, of course, women did a lot of the cooking. They also, of course, took care of children. Um, and sometimes Europeans would see Native men and they would be like, well, these guys are lazy, they're weak, um, and they have their women do all their work. That was one view. Um, the second view that sometimes we see reflected in the document is that Native men were weak because they gave their women too much power, that the women um, you had too much control, that the women were put in positions of power and um, it, you know, and that um, the Native American men should put them back in their place, right? So we see these two views, um, both of which are very sort of, um, look, they're looking down upon uh, Native men in particular, that the Native men either, again, were too weak, lazy, they let their women do too much work, or they made their women do too much work, or they gave their women too much power. Um, and so, again, you can see how if you combine these two slides, um, the Native American outlook on the world and the European views of Indians, what you're going to see is you're going to see a, a recipe for disaster, basically a recipe for real cultural misunderstandings. Okay, so uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit now. We're going to talk about some European history um, because uh, in order to really sort of understand these early English colonies in particular, we have to understand uh, what's happening in Europe. And uh, one of the most transformative events, uh, not just in uh, European history, but really in world history, is something called the Protestant Reformation. Now, I posted in our module a uh, document that kind of uh, summarizes the Protestant Reformation. I highly recommend that you read through that so that you really understand um, the importance of the Reformation in the broader context. Um, but I'll just kind of try to summarize it um, because it is a very, very large topic. Um, you know, I took an entire class on it when I was in college. So it is, a, it is something that's difficult to summarize, but I'm ho I hope that you will understand um, at least what it is and the importance of it, um, particularly in its relationship to U.S. history. So the person that you see pictured here is a man by uh, the name of Martin Luther. He originally was a Catholic priest. And he was a very devout um, Catholic. And he began to have questions about his faith. Um, he began to question some of the systems within the Catholic Church. And these, these questions really sort of vexed him, right? I mean, it was really difficult for him to get over um, a lot of these questions. And in particular, he was very much disturbed by a very common practice back in the 16th century, which was the selling of indulgences. So the Catholic Church uh, was at this time rebuilding the Basilica at St. Peter's in Rome, and they needed money to fund this. And so in order to generate funds for this massive building project, um, they set out an, uh, across the Roman Catholic areas to to gather funds for this project. So what they did was they sold indulgences. Now, what is an indulgence? An indulgence is essentially like a ticket to heaven. So it gives you, it absolves you of your sins. 
um, and it allows you to kind of get a free pass to heaven. That's a very crude way of trying to explain it, but it's the easiest thing that I could think of off the top of my head right now. So um, basically, the priests are going out and they're selling these indulgences, and those that money is then being redirected back um, to uh, Rome, to the Vatican, um, and to the building of St. Peter's Basilica. So that is one example of some of the corruption that was taking place within the Catholic Church at the time that bothered Martin Luther. He also was bothered by this idea that um, somehow these priests, who in many cases he saw as being very corrupt, um, could somehow be the conduit between the people and God. Um, he began to think that perhaps uh, the people should have more of a direct personal relationship with God. So for all of these reasons, he decides to write this protest letter, essentially. And um, he writes this letter. It's called the 95 Theses. And essentially, it's 95 uh, counts against the Catholic Church, right? So he's talking about the selling of indulgences. He's talking about the fact that a lot of the priests are not keeping their vow of celibacy. In fact, a lot of the priests would secretly be married and have children. And so all of these sort of corruptions and violations. And he posts it on the door of a church in Wittenberg, Germany. And when he does this, his intention really is not to break away from the Catholic Church and start a brand new religion, which is what ended up happening. But his intention originally was just to reform the Catholic Church. Um, but it became very clear um, by the reaction of the Catholic Church that, this, that they were not going to uh, reform in the way that Martin Luther would like, and that in fact they saw him now as a heretic. Um, eventually, he is excommunicated from the Catholic Church, and at that point, he is going to start a separate religion. Now, you have to understand the importance of this, because there was only one, at least permittable, religion in Europe at this time, and that was Roman Catholicism. And um, the Roman Catholics had really sort of taken over Europe um, both religiously, but also politically. They had a lot of political influence with the kings and queens and princes of Europe. And so um, when this happens, when Martin Luther decides to break away from the Catholic Church and found Lutheranism, um, this will create a massive religious division. Now, some kings and queens decide to align themselves with Martin Luther. And so you're going to start to see some areas of Germany, some areas of uh, Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, that are going to start to um, convert to Lutheranism. This will cause massive warfare um, in Europe because the the predominant belief at the time is that the people must be the religion of their leaders. Um, and so his Martin Luther's breaking away from the Catholic Church will then cause all of these other sects, religious sects, um, to emerge as well. So all other sects like, for example, Calvinists, um, Presbyterians, Methodists, uh, um, Anglicans, uh, any Protestant sects, Baptists, all Protestant sects other than um, Catholic came from the Protestant Reformation. So that's the reason why it's important. And the reason why it's important also for our story is that these wars, these religious wars, um, Spain will get very much involved in these religious wars, and all of this money that they're making from their colonies in the Americas will slowly be dumped into these wars of religion. And, um, and so the, the Spanish Empire is, be going, going, is going to begin to go broke um, fighting these wars. Um, and at the same time, Europe is going to become very destabilized because people are going to be divided uh, religiously. And, of course, this is a huge motivation for the Puritans who originally come and found the colony at Plymouth. 
and we're going to talk about that in chapter two. But um, so this particular event happening way back in 1517 will trigger a whole wave of um, subsequent uh, events that will eventually lead to a push factor, which will bring a lot of people to the colonies of the Americas. Okay, and then finally, um, before we end today, I want to talk about the French and the Dutch in the Americas. Your textbook actually goes into quite a bit of detail on this, and I don't want to do that, so I'm just going to basically mention that the French and the Dutch did establish colonies in North America. Um, the French, of course, up in what is now Canada, they found Quebec as their first colony, a permanent colony in 1608. Um, by the 1680s, the French had um, moved into the entire Mississippi River Valley. Um, and so they kind of claimed that in the territory to themselves. Um, this is going to be really important for understanding kind of the origins of the French and Indian War, which of course we will talk about later on in this course. Uh, but the French established these colonies there, very remote. Um, they're not very populated. A lot of uh, males, similar to the early Spanish colonies, a lot of uh, French males are coming to these colonies. And in some cases, they are intermarrying with the native women. And so um, there will be this cultural integration between the French and the native people. And just as in Mexico, that is called the Mestizo. Um, in the French colonies, they're called the Matisse. Um, and so these uh, half native, half French um, children, um, they will actually become pretty populous in these early French colonies. But again, their populations remained uh, very small. Going over to the Dutch, um, we have Henry Hudson, who is uh, bringing the Dutch East India Company to the Americas in 1609. Um, and eventually they will establish the trading post, the trading fort in 1624 on the island of Manhattan, uh, which later on will be renamed by the English New York. Um, in, by the 1630s, you have a sort of thriving little colony there on Manhattan, although it always remained very small. But... Um, basically, uh, you've got a very diverse population. The Dutch tended to have very diverse populations anyway. They were much more interested in making money than fighting religious wars. Um, so they tended to have a lot more uh, religious, religious tolerance than a lot of other colonies. Um, so eventually, the and we'll talk about this when it happens, but... Um, the, in this, by the 1660s, the British are going to take over uh, Manhattan Island and what was once called New Amsterdam will be renamed New York after the Duke of York. So um, again, even though the French and the Dutch did have an influence um, in these early colonial periods, um, their their influence was primarily that they were there, that they did create a little bit of a competition for the English when it came to trade and influence. Uh, but eventually, um, it will be the English who will primarily dominate um, these early American colonies. And so that's where we're going to pick up on our next um, lecture in Chapter 2, we are going to talk about the establishment of Jamestown uh, Colony in Virginia, and then we're going to talk about the establishment of Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay Colony in Massachusetts. All right. Take care, guys. See you later. Bye.